Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are joined by the historian and journalist Anna Reid. Anna holds a master's degree in Russian history. She's been the Kiev correspondent for The Economist and The Daily Telegraph and written several books. Her next one in November is called A Nasty Little War. Anna, great to have you on Frontline and to have uh, the joy of your expertise on the history of Ukraine and Russia today in light of current events. Can we just start with your assessment of what is going on with the disappearances, the sackings and the deaths of Russian commanders since the failed Wagner March on Moscow. Well, it's it's obviously um, exposed these and, and widened these pre-existing divisions within the top command, um, and we'd all, already seen quite a turnover of personnel since the beginning of the invasion a year a year and a half ago. And according to sort of semi-confirmed reports, sort of about fifteen senior officers uh, were arrested after that attempted coup three weeks ago. Um, some of whom have since been released, but others, including Surovikin, um, who until till January was commander of Russian forces in Ukraine, um, have not been seen sight of since, they haven't been seen in public since, and are said in you know the sinister phrase to be resting. Um, so presumably under arrest in Moscow, um, and it remains to be seen what happens to them but it's a it's a measure of putin's um you know how, his, his new vulnerability after after the progression mutiny so is it accurate to say there is a purge going on well i think purge probably rather overstates it i mean historically speaking the word purge is a, is applied to um you know blanket arrests of of you know dozens or hundreds of people and the, the numbers aren't anywhere like that. Um, but the fact that people are being, you know, effectively disappeared um, rather than simply demoted or fired um, is very, re- you know, is reminiscent of, 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 of the Stalin era, of the, of the Soviet era. And we know from, um, you know, we know from what Putin says and from the way state pro- Russian state propaganda has framed the whole war, that they see it very much as a replay of the Second World War, of the Great Patriotic War, as it's always called in Russia. And it's something Putin himself, I think, is it's not just a propaganda problem, it's something Putin himself is very aware of. And, you know, Stalin did come out the winner, though, at enormous cost. And I'm sure he sees himself as the next great strong leader of Russia who's going to, you know, restore its place in the world, make it respected and feared. And, you know, there may be something conscious about what he's doing. I'll ask you a bit more about the comparisons with Stalin in a moment, but is the the rooting out of, of threats to Putin being replicated beyond the military in Russia itself? Are we seeing evidence of a stepping up of this? Well, civil society is, uh, you know, it's been going on steadily, ever and stricter and stricter, um, ever since the invasion. Um, you know, you've got more and more websites being blocked. You've got more and more arrests. Um, you've got these, you know, horrible exemplary uh, sentences being um, being delivered on dissidents. I mean, most recently, um, Kara Murza, who is in fact a British citizen and an extremely brave, brave man who's been helping Bill Browder with his campaign against dirty Russian money coming to coming to the West um, for years now. And he's, I, I'm afraid I can't remember how many years it is, but he was given a 15 or 20 year sentence or something recently. And, you know, that's obviously supposed to put fear into others who might step into his shoes. Um, you know, Navalny, again, his sentence was increased. He was given a new sentence also the other day. So, uh, and you, I mean, yes, it's getting, it, it, it's still possible to be sort of pa- passively anti the war in Russia. But if you're a prominent person, if you're actively um, loudly against the war, you are, yeah, you're in danger of arrest. And there are several hundred political prisoners still left over from back in the 2012 Bolotnaya Square demonstrations, pro-democracy demonstrations, um, you know, from over 10 years ago now, who've just been sitting there without trial in Russian prisons. And that number's getting getting steadily bigger. Not, I mean, the, the number of Ukrainian civilians who are in prison um, 
you know, people who are who are in occupied territory who've been disappeared or put into prison for just being suspicious, not actually actively protesting the occupation, but just perhaps wearing a having a yellow and blue ribbon tied to your rucksack. Um, you know, far outnumbers that. That's in the thousands now. There are many, many more Ukrainian political prisoners in Russian prisons now than there are Russian ones. And what is it you think uh, President Putin is trying to achieve? Is it to stay in power for as long as possible? Yes, yes, it is. Um, he's got no, there's no signs that he's yet grooming a successor, although he's now seventy. Uh, he's he's fit, he seems to be, despite all the rumours and all these rather um, sort of wishful thinking uh little video things that do the rounds on social media saying oh he's looking a bit shaky or oh, has he got parkinson's or oh, his puffy face and so on he looks in fact perfectly fit and you know he could could well go on for another 10 years or more um you know he could be like franco or something he could die in harness um, so you know on the other hand he may get ousted tomorrow you know we're always being surprised by russia we've got it consistently wrong we've been very very bad at forecasting on russia and the kremlin is now really a black box. I mean, even even more so than it was pre-invasion because fewer and fewer journalists are actually reporting from inside Russia anymore. They're all doing it from from abroad using Russian contacts um, who themselves are ever more nervous about having, having anything to do with foreigners, you know, particularly the foreign press. So our, our, our knowledge of what's going on is steadily degrading. And it, so, so nothing should be ruled out basically because we don't really know what's going on in, inside the elites. And why has our knowledge of forecasting on Russia been so bad? Well, one big reason, uh, let me think how to phrase this. Um, well, one, it, it's hard, to, first of all, it is hard to predict. You know, it's a, it's a big, a complicated country. Um, so we, we shouldn't blame ourselves too much for getting it wrong. Um, but there are there are things that were there are there are areas where we were incredibly complacent um and self-interested and ignorant. Um one was on just how nasty the Putin regime was. You know, when he when he came in, we wanted the West in general wanted to see him as an improvement on Yeltsin, who was very erratic, very boozy, you know very corrupt, handed out you know, these enormous sort of ex-state-owned industries to his cronies and so on. We wanted to see Putin as an improvement. Okay, he's an ex-KGB man, but he's efficient, he's sober, you know, he's business-like, he's a guy we can guy we can deal with. And as he sort of slowly, gradually became more autocratic, we put our heads in the sand. Um, and we were encouraged to do so, of course, by our own uh, business community, you know, because we put a lot of investment in. So not only the oil and the gas, but the banks, the consultancies, you know, the car firms, the steel firms, you know, a lot of Western money went into Russia. And all those people, it was a big interest group, wanted to see Russia as basically, you know, a bit bit different, you know, not, not your sort of mainstream European country, but basically okay. And uh, these these sort of, you know, these sort of scandals and so on around the edges as, as, as something we didn't really want to worry about. You know, the subject for, for sort of jokey dinner party, um, you know, stories rather than actual uh, sort of disgust. And, only, and you saw it in, you know, cabinet members going off for, for party, you know, to parties on Russian owned, you know, oligarch owned yachts and so on. You know, we, we, we were very flippant. We were self-interested and we were flippant. We didn't take it seriously. We, did, we, we didn't want to see what was actually happening and you know 2014 when russia took its first big bites out of ukraine when she invaded first crimea then the east then the donbass slap on the wrist we we we, we gave it these token sanctions and business very much carried on as usual and it really took that very very bloody full-scale invasion of of 2022 to, to open our eyes and that's finally now happened I mean, not completely to the extent one would guess, because there are a lot of big Western corporates still doing business there, have refused to divest. Um, but basically, we've now finally got it. But it took that to make us get it. We were, we were, we were very naive. We were very complacent.
Now, Anna, you mentioned it earlier, comparisons are being drawn with history and the Great Purge or the Great Terror under Joseph Stalin. Just talk us through how he went about it. Well, the, the, he purged um, the Russian elites and the institutions, all of them, in the late 30s, sort of 36 to 38, the Great Purge, it's called. And hundreds of thousands of people were executed or imprisoned. But amongst the institutions he purged was the army. And it's estimated that about 40,000 officers were arrested in the period. And of those, about 15,000 actually executed. And he basically took out the whole of the senior ranks. So it's three out of his five field marshals, his marshals of the Soviet Union, 15 out of 16 army commanders, 60 out of 77 corps commanders, and 15 out of 25 admirals, all actually executed. So uh, so this was in the late 30s. So when in 41, Hitler invades Operation Barbarossa, the top command of all his armed forces are these overpromoted and terrified juniors who, as you can imagine, are, you know, do not want to put us put a step wrong. They don't want to they don't want to divert from diverge from their orders, you know, by a millimeter for fear of their own heads rolling. So they did not, you know, they would carry on blindly carrying out orders to the best of their ability, just even when they were obviously wrong or out out of date, you know, circumstances has, had changed. They never took the initiative. They never told the bad news to their bosses. They would always just tell the bosses what they wanted to hear. And you can see, you can see the same, you can see many of these things going on um, in the in the Russian government, you know, in the, in the military and the government more generally now. I mean, plainly intelligent, plainly the intelligence services pre the new invasion were telling Putin what he wanted to hear. They were telling him that his tankisti were going to be greeted with, you know, flowers and bread and salt. And the Ukrainians were longing to be liberated. Um, you know, when you know, anybody, even the most superficial knowledge of Ukraine, anyone who knew the country even a little bit, knew that simply wasn't true. When Stalin got rid of some of his most senior and, and most talented generals in that purge, in what you're saying, do you think um, that he actually did lasting damage to the Russian military? He did. Um, and amongst the, the three field marshals he got rid of was a man called Tuhachevsky, who at the time was, you know, he had been a reformist, he had pushed through the forms of the army, and he was, you know, Russia's sort of best military, best, best and best known military thinker by far. He was well known abroad, he was very much respected, and he was one of the ones executed. And he is often held up as, you know, sort of the great loss, the man who could have prevented Hitler overrunning so much of the Soviet Union in the first months of the war. But but Stalin, uh, he 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 actually learned from his mistakes in the course of the war. So he he started trusting his generals, and he allowed Zhukov, who was you know he he promoted talent, so he put Zhukov in charge and allowed Zhukov to become a hero, to become a you know a, a real sort of leadership, you know morale boosting leadership figure for the army, um, which was exactly the opposite of Hitler because Hitler. Uh, started less 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 listen to his generals less and less and sank further and further into sort of fantasy. Um, so which way Putin goes as this war drags on, we'll see. The closest uh, sort of historical parallel, better than the Second World War itself, is probably the Winter War against Finland. So it's this short war from November 39 to March 1940. And there again, it was a Russia completely unprovoked, completely unexpectedly invading its small a smaller neighbour, and in the first uh, stages of the war, taking enormous losses because of its own inefficiency. You know, sort of untrained troops, very poorly equipped. You know, dumb tactics. They took enormous losses. One hundred and twenty-seven thousand Russians supposed to have been. Killed, not not casualties, actual fatalities in the course of that very short war, and the, and the, and the Finns putting up this unexpectedly doughty defence, but in the end, having to settle 
Um, and in the end, it was a peace treaty. It weren't fully occupied. They, they signed an actual treaty, but had to give up vast swathes of territory and their second city, Vibruri, now Vibur, which still belongs to Russia. Um, it's up to northwest of Petersburg on the sea. And it's, you know, that that's, that sort of pattern, though more prolonged, I mean, Ukraine's got a much bigger country than Finland, um, is probably the likeliest outcome, um, you know, sad to say, of this current war, of some sort of territorial settlement, which will mean Ukraine losing a chunk of territory um, and Russia being able to claim victory, though at the, at the cost, you know, enormous human costs. And the latest, the latest estimate for the number of Russians killed, it's 47,000, 47,000 young men, um, which, which, met, met, which, um, uh, one of the now exiled Russian news organizations and a German university have put together using, using on probate data, data from the sort of probate courts and, um, obituaries as well in the papers. And that may well be an underestimate because people with no, 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 no estate to pass on, there are no probate, um, probate actions. How much uh, knowledge do you think there will be in Russia itself of those casualties? Well, obviously they're, they're only admitting, I can't, I think it's 6,000 casualties, um, fatalities that the Russians so far. So, you know, they, they are admitting some, but way under the real number. Just like Stal Stalin did. Yeah. Well, indeed, but you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big country and the conscription has largely been from, has it been from European Russia? It's been from Siberia, you know, it's a real sort of backwards Siberian and Southern towns and also, uh, Central Asians, you know, not, not Russian citizens, but you know, they've been very much encouraged to sign up just for the, just for the pay because, you know, most Uzbeks on and a lot of people are extremely poor. Um, and of course that, you know, the Wagner, the Wagner recruited from the prisons. So again, and those people are often people who've lost touch with their families and, you know, when they die, you know, it takes them, takes a while for the families to find out because Wagner doesn't tell them. And when they do, they go, oh, you know, or said, I haven't seen him in five years. You know, these are, these aren't, these aren't, these aren't, you know, these, these, these are not the kind of people who are going to be turning out on the streets and protesting. So he's just raised the age for um, potential conscription to from 45 to 55, Putin, just, just recently in the last few days. You know, that's the kind of thing will start worrying people. And you can see on the internet searches that Russians are doing. There's some interesting research on that, that, you know, the prospect of conscription really does worry them. And when there was the big conscription drive last autumn, you know, there was the massive exodus of young middle class people, young middle class men from Russia. So, you know, it's tricky. And he's been, he's been, you know, people, people, of course, people are worried. They're not stupid. Um, and if we can just turn back to the purge that was carried out by Stalin, do we know how President Putin regards that? Uh, extended further than the military, obviously, to target anyone who was perceived to be anti Soviet? Well, the, the, his approach to Stalin um, is that he was a great war leader. And so all the sort of ev every sort of state information propaganda around Stalin, it's all about Stalin during the war and how he led the country to victory during the war. And what's more or less ignored is what he did before the war, i.e. the Holodomor, the 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 artificial family in Ukraine and the purges and the gulag and so on. And after the war, when there were more purges and a great many returning Red Army soldiers were sent to Siberia as well, were sent were sent to camps. Uh, so, it, it, you know, people's view of Stalin and of history in general, you know, their own history in general, has been incredibly sort of warped and simplified. People... You know, you're not encouraging, and, and this now is in you know all the schools, all the textbooks, the university courses, and all, and so on. You know, it's it's, it's everywhere now. So, to to get an actual truthful, uh, full picture of your of the Stalinist period, and indeed, of, you know, the your country's history in general now, you have to make a conscious, intelligent, you know, intellectual effort of your own. 
and you have to go out and find those websites. You have to research and think for your own, uh, for yourself and find people to talk about it with, you know, who aren't going to shout you down or report you to your teacher or have you thrown off your university course. You know, it's it's not impossible to do now, but it's very hard. And most people just soak up what's being fire hosed at them, you know, hours a night on state television. Um, you know, you can get to the you can get to the block websites on VP if you know if you know how to get a VPN. Um, but a lot of people don't, you know, particularly obviously older people, they're ex they cost, you have to pay a subscription, they're always blocking them. So you're instantly having to swap from one to another. You know, you need to you need to be really interested, you need to have a certain amount of know how, you need to have a certain amount of time. You know, it's people now are you know, they're 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 radically misinformed about their own history. The, the, the view of their country they have in their head has no connection with reality anymore at all. People have, people have been encouraged to live in this fantasy world and it and and people, you know, a chunk of the population like doing so because it makes them feel better about themselves. You know, they live in a country where there's an enormous gap between rich and poor. You know, there's a vast majority of the population um, yeah, they have, they have, the economy has been growing, but for a vast chunk of the population, living standards have not improved. Um, you know, the, if you look at the if you look at the uh, ab, you know the average age people live to life expectancy, and it's hardly gone up. It's still in the sixties for both men and women, and they feel they still feel um, this sense of sort of that it's the West's fault. Mm. Uh, this this resentment, you know, this deep inferiority complex and resentment, and this feeling that actually we live in a great country and we're making the world fear us and respect us again, makes them feel better about themselves, even if they're still living in this god awful hole in the deep provinces with a crap job, and you know, barely able to afford meat once a week. Um, you know, it's 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 born of inferiority complex. This thing, you know, it's all deeply psychological. You mentioned um, uh, the access to to, his, to proper understanding of history, and it's interesting that uh, President Putin's actions to try and seize Ukraine is based on his own interpretation of history, that Ukraine isn't a real state and, and that Russia and Ukraine have a shared destiny. Why does he see it like that? It's, it's uh, well, if I don't mind going, if you don't mind me going back into history a little bit, Indeed, yes. uh, the eastern half of Ukraine, so east of the river Dnieper, which more or less bisects it down the mi middle, plus Kiev, went to Russia in the second half of the 17th century, went to what was then Muscovy in the second half of the 17th century. So about the same time, Scotland started being ruled from London. Okay, so they, there, there is a long history of not all of present day Ukraine, but a lot of it, half of it, being ruled from Moscow. Um, before that, Ukraine was mostly ruled by Poland, or preceding that, it's called the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. So it has got this history of being ruled by outside powers, either from Warsaw or by Petersburg, Moscow, and being split. Um, so you've got, so it's, you know, it's been a distinct nationality. Um, you know, for, for, for centuries, uh, but it has not been a state. It was never an independent state until 1991, so just over 30 years ago. And that is, there's nothing very unusual about that history. You know, that sort of history of being the underdog nation, got your independence sometime in the 19th or 20th century. You know, that's that's lots of places like that. That's 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 Finland, that's Norway. You know, that that's 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 that's... Slovakia or Slovenia, you know, that that's a common European story. There's nothing sort of weird about that. That doesn't make Ukraine particularly fragile or, um, you know, not a real place. Um, but for Russia, have, Russians, um, and it applies to an extent to sort of liberal Russians as well as nationalist, you know, Putin supporting Russians, they do have this sense of ownership over Ukraine. Um, I, I often feel we'll talk, you know, it's it's a bit like trying to talk to a a sort of rather, you know, sort of conservative Brit in 1900 about Ireland. 
you know, they sort of made, they made even, even somebody who accepts that home rule is, you know, sort of, uh, you know, a necessity and, you know, things have gone too far and we can't carry on ruling Ireland, um, you know, sort of still feels that, you know, it's an unhappy necessity and really Ireland is part of Britain and, you know, we're really, we're all sort of part of the one thing. And, oh, we love Ireland, we love going on holiday that, you know. And Russians sort of feel, Russians today feel a bit the same about, about Ukraine and, you know the the the, the cultures. You know the, the languages are different, but but fairly similar. I mean, it's like um, German and Dutch, for example. And it's a place people have relatives, and vice versa. You know, Ukrainians have relatives in Russia as well. Um, they're likely to have been there a bit, um, but so, so so for them, losing Ukraine is much. You know, as they did back in ninety one, was much much more painful than losing the Baltic countries or Georgia or the Central Asian countries. You know, they felt that they'd lost a part of themselves. Mm. And this, you know, they, and back back when I was living there in, in, in Kiev in the 90s, you know, I assumed that Russia would take this sort of post-imperial path like France or Britain and they'd get used to the idea that, no, they were just a sort of normal European country, they didn't have an empire, and get on with, you know, enjoying life and being a consumer society and sort of, you know, friendly but separate relations with Ukraine. And that did not happen. <laughs> the reverse happened. Um, you know, Putin started off trying to undermine uh, various Ukrainian elections and put his own guy in power. And then the Ukrainians, you know, mass demonstrations would reverse that and he'd be angry. And you know, then, then in 2014, he actually did his first invasion. And now we've got this full-scale invasion last year. So it, it, he went completely the other way. He went completely revanchist and that was a surprise because it's such an irrational thing to do you know mm -hmm. it, it was it, you know ukraine was already heading off on its own path it was more and more separate from russia so if you talk to the ukrainian now who's age sort of you know 50 or under they've never been to russia they've never been they have no interest in going at all when you've got your your annual holiday you go off to poland or germany or the states or you know sean el sheikh or something if you can afford it you know you don't you don't go to you don't go to Moscow. Why would you want to? And particularly after twenty fourteen, of course, at the beginning of this present war, um, you know, people would be ashamed to. You know, what how you know, you are somebody, wouldn't you like to go and see the wouldn't you like to go and see the Hermitage? And they go, Of course I wouldn't. You know, I would be ashamed to you know, to tell my friends I was just going to Russia on holiday. It's our enemy. And that's been the case since twenty fourteen. Um and it's and, and, and people after 2014, people already, um, you know, their 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 relatives in Russia, even close relatives, even parents or aunts or siblings or something, you know, relations have got very difficult, and people would generally res be just down to sort of New Year's chats about how are the kids doing, what's the weather like, carefully keeping off mm -hmm. politics, and now people have absolutely cut off their 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 communication with Russian relatives entirely. And you get these awful stories and very, very common Ukrainian experiences. You talk to Auntie Olga or something and you say, do you realise your your army is bombing us and my neighbours have just been killed and that house opposite me, the building opposite me is on fire. Hold up your mobile to the window. You know, can you hear the air, air raid sirens, Auntie Olga? Can you, he can you hear the, the bangs, the explosions? And she goes, no. No, that's your lot. That's 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 your army. It's a provocatio. It's your army bombing. You know, it's all nothing. Come to Russia where you'll be safe, where you'll be escape those horrible Nazis who've taken over. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's completely mad. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Russians are living in in this sort of in this complete topsy turvy fantasy world. And in terms of the status and the perception of Ukraine, President Putin um, has even been able to persuade world leaders, notably at the time, President Donald Trump, that Ukraine is not a country. Um, in that light, the results of the US presidential elections next year will be pretty decisive in the future of Ukraine, won't they? That's a big worry, yes, obviously, because um, both Trump and DeSantis have said um, very ignorant and discouraging things about Ukraine, like they've characterised the war as a territorial dispute. Mm -hmm. um, they've talked about uh, about Biden writing blank checks for Zelensky, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and, and they're both isolationists. Um, and 
the polls show that Republican voters, amongst Republican voters, support for Ukraine, though they're, they're positive. You know, more people support Ukraine than don't. Um, it's much lower than amongst Democrat voters. So, yes, the, Ukraine, the Ukrainians know that American support is perhaps time limited, um, which is one reason that, you know, they're doing their big offensive now is they need to get back as much territory as they can um, before before the American elections. Yeah. And that, that's 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 going to be one of the defining factors of this war for sure. And if you take a step back, though, how how much do you think uh, Putin's war in Ukraine, in reality, has served to more clearly define the world's understanding of Ukraine as a nation state? Well, yes, our, our, our knowledge is absolutely transformed. Um, and from my point of view, that's one of the that's one of the sort of <laughs> positives to come out of this. So for, for years, you know, I've been interested in Ukraine and talking about Ukraine and, and it's been the most, you know, the world's most unfashionable country, basically. And, you know, also in the nineties, people would say to me, oh, where is that? Is that somewhere near the stands? And I'd go, no, next to Poland. <laughs> and so, you know, right off until very recently, people would say, oh, but don't they all speak Russian in Ukraine? Or isn't Ukrainian really the same as Russian? And so on. Um, but, but, but now, no, I mean, it's now it's obviously you know the world is full of admiration of the way they've defended themselves and their resourcefulness and bravery and I mean I think Zelensky's been amazing you know he is he is he is a performer um, by profession you know he's, he's an incredibly successful comic actor and he knows exactly which buttons to press he talks human um, you know he makes. Putin look like a sort of relic from another age. He makes him look like a dinosaur. Um, and Zelensky is immensely popular. And, you know, his, the fact that he stayed in Kiev um, at the beginning of the invasion, when it looked as though it might fall, when special, Russian special forces were being sent to kidnap him, um, was an act of incredible bravery. And it really turned it around uh, because then, of course, the rest of his government all stayed as well. And, you know, the defence rallied and they, they pushed the Russians back. So, so and yeah, the world stood back in admiration, sort of amazement and admiration, really. And I mean, what's, what's also lovely is the way that, you know, the, the, beyond the sort of, you know, the military side of things, people are getting to understand more about Ukraine. So, you know, it was wonderful seeing a Ukrainian conductor c conducting at the first night of the proms, for example. I mean, that's just fantastic. And lots of Ukrainian film festivals on and lots of Ukrainian novelists now being taken up by British and American publishers and being translated into English for the first time. And, and the, you know, the many Ukrainian refugees we've got here now, they themselves, and they, they're very conscious about it. They say it, you know, I'm an ambassador for my country. Um, I'm representing Ukraine here. And, um, you know, and, and part of my job, as well as being a sort of model citizen, is to get, you know, to tell people more about um, my country and what makes it special and what's, what makes it different from Russia, of course, but also about our, our, our literature, our history, our music, our food, you know, and, ev and everything else. Um, and what I'm looking, you know, one thing to look forward to when the war is over is is lots more that's more people visiting Ukraine just for fun and enjoying it, you know, enjoying lovely Lviv and lovely Kiev and lovely Odessa and finding out, you know, all the many things there are to enjoy there. You mentioned Holodomor and Ukraine also suffered greatly under Stalin with uh, the diversion of food, uh, starving large members of the population. How were the Ukrainians also purged? Well, as well as the four million people in the rural population who were starved to death in this man-made Famine. It was a mixture of deportations plus removal of all foodstuffs and grain crops and potatoes and livestock and everything else from the villages. There was a purge of the Ukrainian intelligentsia, so of sort of teachers, writers, um, scientists, artists, thousands of people arrested or executed, and that generation of people who are doing very interesting. Um, innovative sort of avant-garde work in the 20s. They're known now as the ex executed renaissance. And one of the tragedies of the current war is you're getting it again because a lot of the sort of the flower of the nation, a lot of really bright young people, including a lovely, wonderful prize-winning young novelist called 
Victoria Amelina um, in the last couple of weeks have been killed in the war. And, well, I mean, one, one, one thing is that finally, uh, you know, as a result of the war, we've woken up to the existence of these fantastic people, not only now, but also this executed renaissance from the beginning of the last century. And there's a lovely exhibition of Ukrainian modernism, of paintings from the 1900s, 1920s, coming to the Royal Academy next year, which I heartily recommend. I saw it in Madrid and it's fabulous. It's absolutely ravishing. Um, it's a real, real joy for the eyes. Anna Reid, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Jabot. My thanks to our producer today, Louis Sykes, and to you for watching. If you want to support Frontline, you can subscribe now or you can listen to Times Radio for the latest and in-depth analysis or go online to thetimes.co.uk. From me, though, Kate Jabot, bye-bye for now.